Markets suffered a slight give back day today after yesterday's nice robust rally after Jay Powell's more dovish comments about interest rate hikes. Today, we largely saw kind of a risk off type of a mindset where we had a lot of the technology oriented stocks suffering. In fact, as we look under the hood, we'll discover in tonight's video that most stocks were up today, or at least half of the stocks were up today, even though the market was down a half a percent. And the reason behind that is we were driven by the larger market cap technology oriented companies to the downside. So we'll see what that means for our posture. Then we'll also take a look at some possible green shoots that are being displayed by the small caps. And then lastly, we're gonna get into our trade application example where I wanted to focus on a bearish short selling idea on a software stock that appears to be bouncing down and away from its falling 30 day moving average. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by marketscholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's March 3rd, 2022. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube and click subscribe on our channel. While you're there, make sure you go down below into our description area and sign up for our email distribution list so that way you can be notified whenever we post these videos. We're also heavy users of Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me at Brandon Van Zee. We really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these Market Outlook related posts. And last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join us at the web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's trade activity. Getting started as we typically do here with the heat map of the S&P 500 to get a sense of how things are shaking out here today. It was a bit of a down day, but it wasn't uh, an onslaught of selling like we've seen more times than not recently. Today was a pretty quiet day, all things considered. A um, couple of the, the squares that stand out to my eye, we have Best Buy being uh, one of, if not the best performing stock in the S&P 500 today. It was up 9%. For those of who you didn't that didn't catch my retweet on that this morning, they uh, announced a dividend increase of 27%. Unbelievable. Um, they have 18 years in a row of increases. So a lot of times people don't think of Best Buy as a, as a great dividend growth company, but it's actually proven uh, the haters wrong quite often over time. And so uh, off they went uh, here today. And remember that impacts us here in this presentation as well. Uh, we have a sold put, uh, which is a bullish trade on uh, Best Buy here currently. It, it, that expires, I think, in the month of March. But uh, anyway, that it's not that we were uh, too too uh, far away from um, you know where we wanted it to go anyway. But uh, today helps a little bit, kind of push us in the positive direction there. So uh, I was looking at our our account here a little bit earlier. And we actually have nine different sold puts that we've put on lately. You guys will know that I've been putting a lot of those trades on lately because I've been very upfront with you saying that I personally feel like this has been a great environment for selling puts. Anyway, all nine of those uh, sold put trades that we've done here in this Market Outlook video are in profitable territory. So happy to see that as well. Uh, Gilead just barely, uh, but it is up by a whopping three bucks, I think it was uh, here today. But all the others are, are up nicely, including the, the sold put that we did here just two days ago on JP Morgan. So crossing our fingers that those ones all pan out the way that we, we hope for. But today, Best Buy certainly helped our, our, our hit rate and our success there with a 9% increase. I also see some other uh, nice bright colors. There's Dollar Tree with a nice 4.67% uh, increase here today. Uh, we had Brown Foreman as a dividend aristocrat company. That's the company behind Jack Daniels. Uh, they were up very nicely today, up 7% today. Then I also see uh, Kroger kind of hidden back here with a nice bright green tile. Uh, they were up 11%, so my mistake. Kroger was actually up slightly more than Best Buy. That one pleases me as well. Not only do we own Kroger in some of my previous dividend growth investing class accounts, but we currently own it as well in my top-down trend trading class account. So uh, thankful that that one popped back higher as you guys heard me uh, mention my disappointment with Target the other day. So at least in this case, we were able to hang on to some shares of Kroger and that benefited us here today. Um, in terms of other bright green squares, I don't see a whole lot out there. Uh, there was some consistent price action, I would say, in the utilities. So if you look down in the lower right-hand corner here, it's not that a lot of them are bright green, but they are certainly consistent. The vast majority of utilities were up today. Looks like there might have been only one exception to that, and it looks like that was NRG Energy, ticker symbol NRG, uh, down just under a percent. But it looks like all the rest of the utilities were up today. 
Um, not even energy could make that claim, by the way. And remember, energy has been uh, certainly in the news here lately uh, as oil prices have basically spiked to their highest levels since just after the financial crisis. And uh, I think at one point today, a barrel of oil went for as high as $114 a barrel. And when the, when the oil prices are kind of uh, peaking out like that, you expect a lot of energy companies to go up. But you'll notice here we had a little bit of a um, touch and go feel with energy. A couple of the big stalwarts and uh, ExxonMobil, which I just got done tweeting about with uh, Michael Coe's comments uh, back in December of 2020, interpreting the, uh, the options market's expectations of an Exxon dividend cut that never did come to fruition. And at that time, the stock was at 38 bucks. Of course, these days, Wall Street sentiment has changed considerably around oil companies. And ExxonMobil is more than double from where it was back in those lowly time periods. Uh, so Exxon and Chevron as the two big vertically integrated companies here in the United States did manage to close in the green, but a lot of these other uh, kind of second tier players, Conoco and Pioneer, Occidental, and some of those did manage to close in the red today. There were there were some rumors floating around earlier today that perhaps we would kind of um, thaw out our relationship with Iranian oil now that uh, Russian oil seems to be kind of all cooped up. And so that kind of got uh, traders thinking that maybe, just maybe, there could be some more supply that hits the market. We'll see if that plays out or not, but that kind of fed into a little bit of selling there from some of those oil names here today. You'll see that a, a handful of the, 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 the consumer staples were up, Procter & Gamble and Walmart and those types of companies. Also tweeted about Berkshire yesterday. Uh, I was mentioning how it was just two years ago or so, uh, all of the chatter out there was how this company or that company could be the next trillion dollar company. And, and almost to the stock, they were all somewhat related to technology. Stocks like Apple and Microsoft, of course, and stocks like Facebook and Google and Amazon and Tesla and you know Alibaba and you know Nvidia, those types of companies. But um, interestingly enough, one name that was absent from those conversations largely a couple of years ago was Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, it's kind of like the uh, the story of the, tor the tortoise versus the hare. We're seeing a lot of technology stocks pulling back these days, but we see Berkshire Hathaway continuing to hit all-time highs. And at this moment in time, Berkshire Hathaway has a market cap of $725 billion. So it's got a, a little bit of ways to go before it gets to a trillion. But at this point, you, you don't want to count them out uh, at the rate that they're going. Of course, Warren Buffett releasing his much anticipated annual shareholders letter last weekend. Hopefully a few of you got a chance to read through that. In terms of um, underperformers now today, you can see that uh, we had quite a few of the big banks underperforming. Now, remember yesterday, the big banks snapped back, which I was happy to see. Our, our sold put on JP Morgan is working very, very nicely. We're already up 40 to 50% on max gain on that trade, um, even after today's slight pullback of about 0.71%. But remember yesterday, most of those big banks were up like 3% or thereabouts. So today, a little bit of a give back from yesterday's gains, but certainly those trends are struggling within the financial play much more so than they had been previously. And of course, we spent a lot of time talking about that in the video that I did for you on Tuesday night. But in addition to the financials, notice that discretionary struggled here today. Tesla, of course, being a key piece there, down 4.6%. Amazon also struggled down 2.7%. Here you're seeing Home Depot, Lowe's, McDonald's, Nike, Target, all those big boys uh, all struggling here today. Of course, the rare exception there being Best Buy, which is a unique story since they just reported their earnings and, of course, the massive 27% increase in their dividend. On over here to the left-hand side where we have some of the uh, more um, major players within the, the technology space. Notice that Microsoft and Apple both closed lower today, as did NVIDIA. Uh, Google and Facebook also struggled within the communication services group there. In particular, a lot of those software-oriented com companies struggled here uh, today. Um, largely because of what we saw with a couple of companies that reported earnings yesterday afternoon, um, Okta 
and Snowflake. They may not be as well known and as popular as companies like Microsoft, but they do have large market caps and they struggled mightily today uh, down somewhere between, let's call it eight and 16% depending upon the story. And so that kind of threw a big wet blanket on top of the software names and that'll actually play into our trade application example a little bit later that I'll present in, in the video. Let's go ahead and now take a look at market breadth over here on the main part of the platform. And it was a pretty even day, all things considered. You can see as I pull up the S&P 500, we had 245 advancers, 255 decliners. Now the S&P 500 itself was down a half a percent today. Um, so normally when you have this kind of a split decision between advancers and dec decliners, that's about as close to break even as you can have. That's like a coin flip right there. Um, you would expect that the market would have been reasonably quiet today. But a half a percent pullback is largely as a result of what I had mentioned there just a second ago. Notice when you look at this heat map, one of the benefits of it is you get a sense of what the market caps are of these various companies and really how important they are to the overall influence of the S&P 500. Remember the S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index. So in other words, stocks like Microsoft, Apple, Nvidia, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tesla have a much bigger uh, influence on the overall S&P 500 than other well-known companies like Walmart. Procter & Gamble, Exxon, and even Chevron. It's kind of interesting to think about that Exxon and Chevron, which used to be some of the biggest companies on the planet, are relatively puny compared to like Google and Amazon and Tesla these days. So while a lot of those other areas were able to produce some green prints today, it was largely because these largest blocks and rectangles and squares, whatever you want to call them, the largest ones were mostly in the red today. And so while today was really a coin flip in terms of uh, components, whether they were bullish or bearish, it's kind of interesting as I look at this, I kind of get the impression that if I were to split it kitty corner, it's the lower right hand corner that's green it's the upper left hand corner that's red but the difference is the upper left hand corner contains all the giants of the world that were mostly red and therefore influenced the market to be down a half a percent today even though there was nearly as many advancers as decliners so kind of interesting to kind of think about the markets from that perspective there uh, as well let's go ahead and, and take a look at some charting analysis now and you can see here, I've got my four grid pulled up. Uh, this is chart 4B. We actually talked about chart 4B earlier today in my question and answer session for one of our newest students. Um, so remember, if you are a premium member of ours and you've got questions about how to import the charts or questions about how to interpret the charts or what have you, that's what our question and answer sessions are for. I teach mine on Thursday mornings. David teaches his on Saturday mornings. Anyway, let's talk about uh, wh where things stand after today's trade activity. You can see that it was a down day across the board. S&P 500 was down 0.53%. Dow Jones was down 0.29%. So it was our leader today. Um, NASDAQ Composite was down 1.56%. And the Russell 2000 was down 1.29%. So today the NASDAQ was the laggard and the large cap kind of blue chip Dow Jones Industrial Average was the leader. For those of you that follow Kathy Wood and her ARK Investments, whether it's the, the Innovative Flagship Fund or any of her other uh, subsequent funds, uh, they were all suffering tremendously today. So it was another day where those stocks that have struggled for months and months and months, that maybe there was some optimism that with the, the stock market rebounding late last week after the, the Ukraine-Russia war news kind of settled in, um, we're right back down there to a lot of the lower levels in many of those companies. So it has been absolutely brutal with those innovative and disruptive types of companies out there. And remember, none of these four are a direct um, corollary to Kathy Wood's funds, but the closest one that you could say that would be, would be the NASDAQ composite. Um, but remember that the NASDAQ composite also contains stocks like Apple and Microsoft that are much more substantial than the innovative and disruptive companies that she tends to focus on. In fact, we were talking about um, one such company yesterday in my factor-based swing trading class where I said there's a, a good opportunity to short Coinbase 
and uh, Coinbase actually rolled over very nicely today. It was down 8% today. So any of you that might have taken that bearish trade for my factor-based swing trading class yesterday, uh, you are certainly heading in the right direction after just day one right there. But you know, Coinbase wasn't, wasn't alone. I don't want to pick on them, but just because they happen to be part of my class here recently, uh, they're easy for me to, to come up with. But the truth of the matter is the vast majority of the Kathy Wood stocks just got smashed today. Uh, ARC is uh, our... ARC with an extra K on the end, for those of you that are not familiar with it, is the ETF that represents her flagship fund, so ARKK, and you can see it was down 6.36% today. And you can see the ARC is back to strongly bearish posture according to the market forecast technical indicator there. So anyway, um, the NASDAQ composite is not getting uh, beat up nearly as bad as uh, ARC because it does also contain a lot of actually higher quality companies, not just the innovative and disruptive ones. But without a doubt, that that um, philosophy that um, you know higher tech stocks still find a home in the NASDAQ to a higher degree or a higher percentage than they find a home in something like the Dow Jones played itself out here today. And it's kind of being directly seen through the numbers. Now, despite having pullbacks across the board with all four of these major U.S. equity indices, notice that the posture of all the charts remains bullish. So uh, I must admit it's a little surprising to me, but it is what it is. And you've got to you know uh, pay attention to the, the, the metrics. It's not to say that the market forecast technical indicator is the perfect technical indicator out there. Remember, there's literally over 200 technical indicators. Market forecast is simply one of them. So they're all going to have their own positives and negatives that you have to kind of um, you know, wade through on occasion. But right now it is worth noting that despite, um, you know, a, a stock market that struggled today and struggled on a couple of days earlier this week, we still have those bullish postures in place. In fact, I'd take it a step further for the Russell 2000. Notice that the Russell 2000 now has a dark green background color as, as opposed to yesterday and earlier this week with that lighter green. And remember what that reflects is we now have a strongly bullish posture on the Russell 2000, not just a weakly bullish posture. Remember what I told you guys on Tuesday that I was impressed with the Russell 2000 and its resiliency in recent weeks. And now you're starting to see that manifesting itself through the posture change itself. We actually spent a lot of time talking about that very topic uh, yesterday in my factor-based swing trading class where we discuss the low size factor. We've seen a, a vast improvement in the low size factor, which matches up nicely with the Russell 2000 small cap index. So um, you, you could get away with saying that the small caps are the leadership group right now. Not only are they the only one that has a strongly bullish posture as opposed to a weakly bullish posture, but they're also the only one that's currently trading above its moving average. Notice that the S&P 500 touched its falling moving average earlier today, as did the NASDAQ composite, but they both sold off and pushed back and away from it. The Dow still has a ways to go to get back up to that level. So the Russell 2000 has kind of quietly started to assume a leadership role. Not quietly in the sense that you haven't heard it here because we've been talking about it here, but quietly in the sense that I haven't really been hearing people on CNBC or Bloomberg talking about this. Now, I don't get a chance to watch it all day, so I'm not here to say that it's never been mentioned, but it's just, it doesn't feel to me like it's a big talking point that, that people are re referencing right now. But that's the benefit of watching this video or attending my factor-based swing trading class. We analyze the data. It's not just talking points. We're, we're actually seeing it with our own two eyes. It is happening whether other people want to believe in it or not. So whether it continues or not is anyone's guess. But what we do know is that if there's ever a reversal in trend, and that's what we're waiting for on all of these charts, right? We're in down trends across the board. If there is ever to be a reversal, it's got to start somewhere. And how does it start? Well, it starts by eventually crossing over the moving average. And sometimes it needs some time to stay above the moving average. Sometimes it tests it and it fails, right? You can make that claim that it did that back here in late December. It tried to get above the moving average, but it quickly failed. So that's why you can't just be gung-ho to say, okay, the coast is clear. Let's all pile into the small 
caps and expect a big move to the upside, but you're putting a pin in that possibility. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, if a few weeks advance and we continue to hold these levels above the moving average, eventually this downtrending moving average will start flatlining if price action stays above it. And if that's the case, then you're starting to kind of shift your mindset. When we have a downtrending moving average, your mindset should be that the moving average will represent resistance, right? Just kind of like we've seen up here with the S&P as it approached it there, it used it as resistance. As it approached it there, it's used it as resistance. The question right now in the S&P is, is it once again using it as resistance? But with the Russell 2000, it's acting a little bit different, like it wants to stay above there. And therefore, if it stays above there long enough, let's say a week or two, then you start shifting your focus to the moving average is no longer acting as resistance. It very well might act as support and a launch pad higher. So we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit by having that conversation, but at least by addressing it, it helps kind of plant that seed in your mind that that could be a topic that we're discussing in a couple of weeks, and I'd rather have you guys mentally prepared for that possibility so that way you're in a position of, uh, of strength, not weakness, in your willingness to take those types of trades if that is to be what unfolds going forward. So anyway, kind of an interesting day where um, you know it was a little bit of a give back day after a nice obsession yesterday after Jay Powell kind of calmed the markets down, uh, insisting that he's not going to go crazy uh, out of the gate with uh, with interest rate boosts, and he's kind of ease his way into it. So that appeased the market yesterday. We did get back some of those gains today, um, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. I would say that the, the one that looks the worst from that perspective is the NASDAQ. You will notice that we did have a bearish engulfing candle on the NASDAQ. So in other words, today's body, which is all colored in, in, in red right there, fully engulfs the prior day's body. And so that's generally perceived as a, a bearish indication there. Notice that with the other charts, we did not have that happen. Most of these other charts just gave back part of yesterday's gains. With the NASDAQ, we gave back all of yesterday's gains. And so it's a little bit more concerning there for that particular index. But all in all, you know, we're, we're hanging in there. Remember, in, in previous weeks, we might have expected days like today that were sell-off days to be massive 1% and 2% sell-off days. But today, we were only down a half a percent on the S&P 500. So while it sounds a little peculiar, you might be um, able to, to kind of call that a, a slight win for the marketplace uh, on the bullish side of the equation. But obviously, we've got a long ways to go, so we don't want to um, get out there and start running victory laps or anything like that. I think the, the torchbearer for bullishness right now has been passed on over here to the Russell 2000, and we'll see if they can uh, keep on moseying higher here, and we'll keep you abreast of that as long as you keep on tuning into these videos. All right, let's go ahead and pop on over here to the internet. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support uh, these presentations. Remember, David and I do these presentations free of charge, even though we're busy business owners trying to uh, you know, implement plenty of other things for the paid side of our, our, our website. So our hope is that you get value out of these free presentations and that you get enjoyment out of them. And in exchange for that, you're willing to um, you know, click like for us on Twitter or promote us in other ways on social media of your choice. As I always tell you, as long as we're up and over 100 likes on my most recent uh, presentation, I'm happy to do a full-length version of the video for you the next time around, including a trade application example. You guys did an excellent job for me the last time around. 114 of you clicked like. For a couple of uh, the, the recent ones that I did, we were kind of touch and go right around, let's say, 105 likes or thereabouts. So a lot more of you came out of the woodwork to help support this presentation, and I do thank you for that. So uh, thank you to Roger, and thank you to Victoria, one of our uh, most recent market scholars. And thank you to Ron and Prickly Trader and Anthony and Deborah and TFib and Claire and John and Richie and Kenneth and Freddie and Jason and Easy and Linus and Carl, Paul, Paul, Mark. Too many to name here. But you guys know that I see your notifications come through when you click like. So I know who of you is clicking like and I also know who of you is not clicking like. Not that it's a big deal, but those of you that are taking the extra effort to click like do know that I notice you 
you, and I, I appreciate that, and I, I respect the fact that it's taking a little bit of time out of your day. And again, we've had a few more people click like the last time around, so special shout out to somebody like Freddie, and a special shout out to somebody like Anthony, because I don't recognize your names. I recognize all these other names because all the rest of them have done a good job supporting this video regularly, but it's nice to have a couple of new names filtering in there helping support the video as well. So special thanks to those of you that might have been part of that extra 10 or 15 that pushed us up and over nicely over 100 this time around. So keep up the great work there. I really appreciate that. And uh, it's your best way to say thanks for taking the time out of our day to do these videos. Remember, all in these videos do take about three hours of our day. Uh, it's not just the recording of the video, it's everything else that goes into it. So uh, to do that free of charge every single trading day when we're around, obviously David's on vacation right now, uh, is a big undertaking. And if you, if you wanna say thank you for that, simply click like for us there. And thank you once again. Um, also, Earlier today, I had quite the marathon session of the um, of the question and answer uh, class that I taught for our premium members. I've been joking that this week, since I've been kind of manning market scholars by myself while, while David is out there enjoying his much-deserved vacation, um, that my classes have gone extra long this week. And I, I, I'm joking that I'm, I'm taking David's time that he would have had in his premium classes, and I'm basically just tacking it on to my classes. The truth of the matter is I'm just trying to be extra detailed and thorough for those of you that joined us last week after our 2 2 2, two, two sale. And I know how hard it is to kind of feel like you're, you're you're getting your legs beneath you when you start off on a new journey and so wanted to make sure that you felt comfortable in my classes this week so uh, today was actually the very first time in in my history that I, I taught a four hour plus class uh, usually on Thursdays I have to cap it off at about three and a half hours because David needs the WebEx platform because he teaches his class shortly thereafter. But with David being out of the office today, I didn't have that constraint. So we actually went more than four hours in today's session. For those of you that missed it, uh, if you are a premium member, here's some of the topics in case you want to go back and watch the recording. Talked about some of the housekeeping notes for our new students. Talked about how um, we think about dividend growth investing portfolios and whether we uh, adjust our position size from three to five percent or whether we just kind of let um, the market decide who our winners should be over the long term. Also got a question on how to interpret an options chain for our options for long-term investors class, how to think about ROR and how that gets calculated on the platform. Also got a question on MSM, uh, which is a somewhat lesser known dividend stock that kind of competes with Granger and Fastenal. I also got a question on how to import our charts from one of our newer students, Dr. Bob, uh, and showed him where to get all of our 50 plus chart scripts to be imported. Uh, also got a question from another one of our newer students there, Prakash, uh, and uh, he was wondering, you know, how do you uh, get the uh, workspace, the, the, the Thinkorswim workspace to change colors to look like uh, the one that I present in class. Uh, also got a question about talking about metals and mining. We were talking about XME as a trend trade uh, in my recent top-down trend trading class and he had some questions about different silver and gold ratios and some of my history with trading uh, the, the gold mining companies and my thoughts on that topic generally and then uh, also had a question on how to use our position size calculator and how to use our price setting levels on our thinkorswim charts using different uh, colored lines. So lots of great stuff there, but you can see that today's uh, question and answer session had a little bit of a different feel than it typically does. Today's feel, if I were to describe it, is it was dedicated quite a bit more to our brand new students. So if you are one of those brand new students that just signed up uh, a week or two ago under our 22222 sale, uh, then this is a, probably a good um, recording for you to sink your teeth into. And remember, we've got our timestamps here, so that way you can time or you can fast forward directly to those timestamps if you don't want to watch all four hours of that presentation here today. Uh, additionally, wanted to show you our factor selector tool. Now, just a reminder that this gets updated on our website on Tuesday evenings. Technically, it gets posted Wednesday morning, but it's based upon Tuesday night's closing price information. So uh, point being, it's a, it's a couple days stale at this point, but 
can give us a general sense as to any movements that we are recognizing from a factor perspective that's taking place out there. You'll notice that our bookends did not change. Dividend yield continues to lead in this market. Quality continues to lag. I did show uh, our students here in class on uh, Wednesday why I believe quality is lagging, and it ba it's based upon the components of quality shifting dramatically in recent years towards technology stocks. A lot of people don't naturally think of technology as being quality, but if you were to actually break down the indices, uh, that is the case, and uh, I think it's rightfully so. Uh, Software uh, business models are superior to a lot of other business models that are out there, and the stock market has recognized that lately. But unfortunately, technology stocks are out of favor right now, so it's kind of putting uh, almost unfair pressure upon quality as an investment class from a formal factor perspective. But we also talked about this shift that we see here between low size and value, and that low size is what I had already identified with you guys um, here earlier uh, in the in the presentation, and including uh, earlier presentations as well, when I mentioned that the Russell 2000 has become much more stable lately. And you're now starting to see that show up here in the low size factor as well. Um, technically, the Russell 2000 is not part of what I'm tracking for this. I'm using other ETFs and securities for that. But they do have a lot of overlap because they both are striving to look at lower sized companies. And so oftentimes they are one in the same. And you will see here that, again, I don't think a lot of people are talking about this, but we're actually seeing legitimate outperformance out of small cap types of companies right now. Um, value did slip a little bit here. And as I kind of explained to my, my factor-based swing trading students, value is largely made up of um, uh, of financials and energy, and it, it's been the case for quite some time. At the beginning of this year, um, energy and financials were rip-roaring to the upside. Fast forward to where we're at right now, and only one of those two continues to rip-roar, and of course we know who that is. It's the energy stocks. They keep on just cruising higher. But the financials have had such a big give back here recently from a sector perspective that it's actually starting to negatively impact the value factor itself. So it's kind of interesting to note that as well. All right, let's go ahead and get back on track with some additional think or swim chart analysis, starting with chart 5A. These are our asset class 12 grids. Remember that the background colors of these charts will tell you whether the current market forecast posture is bullish or bearish. So one thing that um, kind of stands out a little bit more is 10-year treasury yield in the lower right-hand corner. For the longest time, this was a green chart. Notice how it is dark pink now, telling us that we actually have a strongly bearish posture. I think when we looked at it previously, it was a weakly bearish, but now it's strongly bearish. And the reason for that is the intermediate line on the market forecast is at 42 and falling. So now that it's fallen below the chart's midpoint of 50th percentile, it's now considered strongly bearish. For those of you that are new, if you've gone through the process of importing all of these charts, one helpful tip is when you get to these 12 grids, you can right click on the 12 grid and go to maximize cell right here. And when you do that, it then open, opens it up to a full screen view and you can actually see the market forecast technical indicator down below. So that way you do know that this green line is falling and down below the 50th percentile. And so you also know that it's in a bearish condition at this moment in time. So uh, in order to get back to the 12 grid view, you would just simply hit this kind of back arrow type of a, uh, of a key up there that says minimize cell. There's actually a, a left arrow there. You don't need to hit that one. You can if you want. What that'll do is it'll cycle through the 12 grid there for you. If you actually want to go back to the 12 grid view, you would click this one that is kind of like a curved arrow up there. So I'm going to click on that to go back to our 12 grid view right here. Notice as well that um, they're not alone. You still have a couple of other charts up at the top that also have a strongly bearish posture, and that's your foreign developed stocks and your foreign emerging stocks. And I would say that both of those are being negatively impacted by the same thing, effectively Russia, Ukraine. Remember that 
Russia itself is an emerging market stock, so Russia is part of EEM. And although Russia is not technically part of EFA because most of EFA is basically developed Europe, Europe has a fairly close relationship with Russia and indirectly impacts it in things like, you know, getting um, oil and natural gas from Russia to Europe to help their economies along. That is now being called into question. And a lot of the European banks also are being called into question because of some of the Russian assets they might have on their on their balance sheet and things like that. So anyway, it's kind of interesting to note here that all of a sudden, ever since the breakout of the Russia-Ukraine war, um, the, the foreign markets have really suffered dramatically more than the U.S. markets. Notice the S&P 500 has popped back to its falling moving average. Notice during that exact same time period, EFA and EEM have actually been falling back and away even further, and they're close to multi-month lows, if not at it already. So they are really struggling right now on a relative basis. All the other charts are actually green at this moment in time. Now, naturally, some of the charts look better than others, but you can see that some of our strongest charts remain down here on this bottom rung. These three charts right here, along with Bitcoin, are the only ones that have that dark shade of green, telling us that we have a strongly bullish posture. So um, obviously, we know the impact of war on oil and gold, and you'll see that they both continue to go up without question. Um, today, oil did pull back a little bit, as I mentioned before, as part of uh, the, 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 the rumor floating around that some of the Iranian um, oil reserves could be released. Whether that comes to fruition or not, we don't know. What we do know is that oil has absolutely skyrocketed in the last week. So if this is what you call a give back day, it's a, it's a whimper. <laughs> uh, there, this dog has no teeth, right? This is only a 1% give back day after oil has absolutely erupted higher. Notice that gold actually was up today. Again, we talked quite a bit about gold earlier in my class, so feel free to check out that recording if you need to. Notice here that gold was up 0.6% today. Both of them remain above rising moving averages. Both of them continue to have strongly bullish postures. In fact, the intermediate lines on both of them are in the upper reversal zone above the 80th percentile. US dollar was also quite strong today. It did hit a new uh, multi-month um, high, uh, both intraday and closing high, as it closed higher by about 0.4% um, or thereabouts. Let's now take a look here at our sectors. And from a sector perspective on chart 5C, you will see that things look reasonably rosy from a posture perspective. Now, when you actually look at the charts and do a little bit more technical analysis, there's quite a bit yet to be desired. But hey, we, we'll, we'll take baby steps in this case. And we do have a clean sweep for once in terms of bullish postures. Now, when we break that down further, uh, we have a strongly bullish posture, of course, out of energy. We continue to have some reasonably strong activity in these defensive areas down below as well. So it's not the it's not the preferred sectors that you would like to see with the strongest postures, but again, we'll, we'll take what we can get. So uh, you will notice that with these other three charts down below here, healthcare, staples, and utilities are now all back above their moving averages. In the case of healthcare and utilities, those moving averages are actually rising. With the case of uh, staples, it's actually falling just a little bit. Notice the yellow moving average as opposed to the green and the green. But there's progress being made down there, and I think that's a, that's a decent sign, all things considered. With our more cyclical and aggressive sectors, there's still quite a bit more work that needs to be done. Notice that technology was down 1.19% here today, so that's a pretty ugly looking candle. You also had consumer discretionary down 2.26% here today. Notice the bearish engulfing candle there just below that falling moving average as well. So that chart's not looking overly healthy at this moment in time, despite it still having that weekly bullish posture there. So so, you know, you can differentiate without a doubt between the better trends and the weaker trends amongst these so-called bullish postures. And I still think that it's 
oil or energy stocks that do have the best looking trend out there to the upside and the ones that are still the most concerning would be kind of discretionary technology and um, financials now that's a good segue into our trade application example for today because i will be concentrating on the technology sector which was to one of today's biggest losers down over 1%. And again, part of the reason behind that is as a result of the uh, poor results or at least poor implied results from stocks like Okta and Snowflake overnight with their earnings announcements. To give you a sense of that, Okta, ticker symbol OKTA, uh, was down 8% today. Notice that bounce down and away from that falling moving average. And then look at Snowflake, uh, kind of the same type of thing, in this case even more dramatic, down 15% here today, easily breaking through that prior support area, bouncing down and away from that falling moving average. So it's not a very good feel out there for some of those kind of second tier software companies. Um, so I thought, hey, let's let's pick on them while they're down. And I wanted to pull up another software company. This one, obviously, much more substantial. This is Salesforce.com. And it's been around long enough where I don't really necessarily think of it the same way I might think of Snowflake or Okta. Then again, I still don't think of Salesforce the same way I think of Microsoft. So in other words, Microsoft's kind of the king, the most established. They've been around the longest. But Salesforce has been around long enough now where they're kind of in that middle category. They're not one of the new up-and-comers. So anyway, um, you're not really getting overly aggressive perhaps in this case, but it did seem like it was at least an interesting trade setup to kind of implement a bearish trade idea. Remember, most of the trades we've been doing lately, at least in my videos, have been the bullish trades. All of those nine sold put examples are all bullish trades as an example. Um, I do have um, Danaher and Microsoft as other bearish trades that I did put on, but otherwise it's been mostly bullish trades that I've been placing. So I've been kind of looking uh, for opportunities to put on additional bearish trades when uh, they pop up. And it did seem like today was one of those days where we saw a lot of those technology-oriented companies that had a nice bounce off of the, the lows from last week after the Russia-Ukraine uh, news broke, uh, bouncing back to their moving averages, but now starting to look like they're stalling out again here. Now, initially, I did want to put on an options trade for this, but I was trying to kind of price out some bear call spreads, and it just wasn't working out the way that I wanted it to. Sometimes you get um, these higher price securities that are, you know, in this case, over $200, and um, you start having like... Um, $5 or $10 between your options chain, and it doesn't provide a whole lot of flexibility for a precise placement of sold strikes. And so uh, instead of doing an options trade on this one, I just did a very basic short selling idea where I'm short selling the stock itself. And what I'm doing in terms of levels is I put the stop loss a few pennies above yesterday's high which means that if I want to implement a one-for-one -one reward risk relationship, that would put my price target somewhere down in this vicinity where these three candles from last week kind of crossed into. So I'm not requiring a further breakdown in this chart, but I do need this stock to get kind of get back down to those similar levels from last week. Now this is a pretty tight stop loss here that I'm implementing on this one. So just be aware that it is possible we could get stopped out fairly quickly if the markets turn very bullish in the near term. Then again, we could also hit our price target fairly quickly if the markets get pretty aggressively bearish. But the point is, we'll probably be out of this one fairly quick compared to some of the other trades that I tend to put on. So just be aware of that. That might not be right for all of you. So uh, make sure you're always doing what's right for you and your own personal situation. But clearly you can see um, Salesforce has been in a prolonged downtrend. You have a bearish near-term posture, as you can see from the pink background color here with that uh, blue line falling in this case. And then you do see an underperformer versus the S&P 500's dotted line up here on chart 3A as well. You can see these labels up at the top are red across the board. So whether you're looking at year-to-date, one month, three month, six month, nine month, or one year, Salesforce is down in all of those time periods. So there is weakness across the board that's already kind of embedded into this trade here. So I figured let's let's use this as a rare bearish trade example. 
So that's what I had for you here in tonight's video. I appreciate you guys checking it out as always. If you get that opportunity, remember to hit like for me there on Twitter. As long as we're up and over 100 likes, I'll plan on doing another full-length video for you on Tuesday. If we're under 100 likes, then I'll just plan on doing a quick hitter 15-minute video on only the indices themselves. Also, we appreciate those of you that subscribe to our YouTube channel and participate in our other social media venues there as well. Remember, David should be back from his vacation tomorrow. I haven't heard from him yet, uh, but as far as I know, it's all all systems go and he should be back for his technical analysis class for our premium members tomorrow and then should be back with those of you that are our free uh, guests here in the market outlook video tomorrow night so look forward to hearing his thoughts um, uh, you know based upon his time away here over the past week there as well so with that I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments goodbye for now